Well, I'm very excited for this next interview today with Dr. Mike Kelleher, graduate of Tufts University back in 1993. Um, you've been doing this for 21 years. Um, yeah. You're probably most known for uh, not just CAD CAM, but um, CAD CAM with E4D. That's um, right, yep. So um, I'm really excited. I want to talk to you about CAD CAM. I want to talk to you about uh, what 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 is the population in your town? Are you Would you say you're more major urban? No, a small suburb of Springfield, Massachusetts. Okay, and how many how many people are in Springfield? Oh, I'm not sure about Springfield. Uh, the town we're in is probably under twenty thousand, though. But but when you leave your town, would you not mm -hmm. know it that you're in Springfield, or would it be? Oh yeah, no, Springfield's a pretty good sized city, so it's the third largest city in Massachusetts. Okay, yeah. and uh, so I, I I've been I've been I've been liking to start all my podcasts off with just the the general question of the fact that. Uh, for a guy like me, graduating in 87, been doing this uh, uh, 27 years, wow, yep. this last recession was a whammy. Yeah, it was um, tough. Yeah, I mean, I've lived through several of them, and the one thing they all had in common is they were about 18 months of uh, pain yep. and misery, and then it was yep. back back going again. And this one, 2008 to 2014, a lot of dentists on Dental Town are just crying that uh, my, my city's economy is flat, huge yep. unemployment. Lots yep. of people aren't getting approved for financing. Yep. And uh, so um, guys like you have been doing this for two decades. Yep. Uh, share with these listeners from uh, not just the United States, but around the world. Um, what are you excited about in your practice? And, and what, what makes you excited? And, and what, what's growing your practice? Where, where do you find yep. enthusiasm and passion? Well, I mean, we, we're, I mean, I'm a big technology guy. So anytime we put technology in the equation, it seems to be uh, the, the fun stuff. It's, it's the toys. So we enjoy that. But basically, we're a bread and butter dental practice. We, we do kind of the, the general stuff. So, um, you know, enjoy just taking care of the patients every day and seeing a, a broad uh, spectrum of procedures and types of patients all day long. So and what that's, procedures that's do you do? I mean, do you do pull wisdom teeth? Do you do molarendo? No, do you, no we, do do, you, we, do, we do pretty much everything, except I don't do a lot of surgery. That's about the only thing we don't do is surgery. So you don't, do, you don't place implants or remove wisdom teeth, but you do molarendo? Uh, yeah, do some do endo, but just about everything except the the surgery. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and what made you get into CAD CAM? How long you've been doing CAD CAM? Uh, we we've been doing CAD CAM for about five years now. Uh, we got into it. Uh, yeah, about almost exactly five years ago. Um, well, we have been looking at the technology for for quite a while. It had interested me quite a bit uh, to be able to bring that technology into the office. And so we've been kind of watching, watching, and finally the thing that set us into doing it was waiting for the materials to mature. So when we started seeing, I started seeing EMAX cases actually on Dental Town from the the, our, the CEREC users, and seeing that boy, these guys are getting very good restorations. Uh, the the material quality seems to be good. The the uh, EMAX had been around in press version for a while before that. So you know, once we saw a a good quality material and saw that the technology had matured to the point where we could get a a good quality restoration, then then we started really looking heavily at it. Um, I have a practice with with two partners, so for us it was a uh, pretty much a no-brainer to uh, bring that technology in because it really did cut our laboratory expenses tremendously. So we were able to to, to uh, cut our expenses a lot, and especially if we were talking about in the economy, uh, being able to control some of your costs uh, that way w was a big help, especially seeing where laboratory expenses have gone in the past few years with the prices of metals going up and, and all that sort of thing. So your statement of income on your lab bills, was it before CAD CAM, was it 10% and what did it drop to? Um, well, we, well, where I mean, did I, it start and where did it drop to? Uh, um, numbers wise, I'm not sure. I know we, we've dropped it by over, over half cause we're doing almost everything in house in terms of, uh, you know, all, all single units are done in house. Most of our, you know, one or two, you know, two or three cases. And we're even starting to mill bridges and stuff in the office as well now. So most of that is in house. Now we still will send out obviously, uh, a big bridge that uh, is something we can't mill and removable and stuff like that. But, but, but in terms of all, all virtually all the single units just are in house now. So, so what initially got you the most excited was that it was technology. Number two, yep. was it to lower the lab bill oh, or was lower, it the, yeah, yeah, or was it the patient um, one day experience? I, I want to, I want to remind the, I, I'm 52. I want to remind the, uh, these young kids that when I was a little kid, I remember <laughs> I, one of the saddest summers I had was my best friend, broke his glasses and yeah. back then it took six weeks to get into the eye doctor and then right. they sent the prescription out he basically couldn't see all summer 
Right. And then we saw the birth of uh, Lee Optical, Eye Masters, Pearl Vision, where you, sure. you just walk in there and an hour later yeah. you walk out with glasses. Was right. that a big part of the equation? Same that day was, crowns? That was definitely a big part of it, um, to be able to provide that. Um, you know, one of my least favorite, and I'm sure everybody's least favorite emergency phone calls to get is the temporary came off on a Saturday afternoon phone call, which we all had to deal with uh, to not have to have that. And the you know the the patient experience is great to be able to provide the the service in one visit is is a big one. So it was a combination of a lot of factors, but you know uh, seeing where where the technology had, had merged to it and and the materials had evolved to it just made a lot of sense. So everything had kind of gelled together to be able to provide that in the office rather than the having to send send all that stuff out. So and and there's also I'm hearing a lot that you know a temporary you 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 tried to make it well you tried to do yep. everything well but bacteria leak. Oh, absolutely. Uh, is, yeah. what, um, we're seeing a lot less endo in same day yeah. restorations. Would you I, I, would you say that's would, true? Ab or absolutely agree. Anecdotally, and and it's not something I've tracked, so I really couldn't say percentage wise. But it's very very rare nowadays that I will send a, a patient for endo post crown, whereas it wasn't super common before, but it, you, enough that you you'd know it was there. Uh, so it, it's rare, very rare that we're doing that, and and that is a big advantage. You're able to cut that prep, and within about an hour, you're you're sealing that restoration with, with the resin, and it, it's not having any time to take bacteria in. So and what I, resin are you cementing your Cerax with? Or, uh, or uh, CAD CAMs? CAD CAMs I'm doing with, e with, uh, with, yeah, with the uh, Surpass uh, Apex materials uh, uh, and Anchor. Surpass uh, surpa and Anchor? Surpass, and surpass Bonding Agent Interface and Anchor, yeah, the usual. And, and, and who makes those? That's Apex Dental. Apex Dental. So, yep. so say it again, Surpass? Surpass. Interface and anchor. Interface and anchor, and those are all three from Apex Dental. All three from Apex Dental. Yeah. And what yep. made and what made you choose those? Well, I had been using the Surpass bonding agent for a very long time, uh, and I've had f fantastic results with that in terms of low sensitivity. And the anchor is is a uh, core buildup material and a resin cement, so I had that in the office as well. So it's kind of a nice way to be able to keep inventory relatively minimal, not have to have a special resin cement. Uh, and it's products that I knew had worked very well for me and as well. So, And I'd seen other, other CAD CAM users having good success with that combination of materials. So, and that's, combination, a dual, think, that's a dual cure? It's a, it's a dual cure. Yep, absolutely dual cure. So it's, uh, you know, you, you, um, you place it, let it gel, and, and clean it up. It cleans up real nicely and, uh, you know, like I said, very, very low sensitivity. So it's, it's a now, it's a now you're you're part of three dentists in one office. Yep, three, three dentists. Partners. In one office. So yep. have you guys all intellectually agreed to use this so you don't have ten, ten different bond, three different bonding agents or? Un un unfortunately, no. And you know you know how this goes with you know it's three partners. I'm I'm, I'm the youngest of the three, so uh, you know getting getting things changed isn't always uh, as easy as I would necessarily like it to be. But um, it, it it everyone has their favorites, and and you you kind of if you get very comfortable with something, then you're going to stick with it. And if you've had success, then and so there's no reason necessarily to change it would be it would be great if we all were using the same materials for everything but that's maybe not realistic to expect you, that right and i i you know a lot of dentists always complain about their supply costs being high and yep. they always want to blame it on you know uh patterson or shine or benko or burkhart but then yep. you start looking at the details you're like okay why are two hygienists and a dentist using three different kinds of gloves. Why, yep. why, you know, and then when you ask them to make the painful decisions that would lower their supply costs, they say, never mind, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I know. So I, I, want, I want to talk about, um, let, let's, let's go to your earliest decision. So we have um, two major players in the market, E4D right. uh, and Serona. And, yep. and at the last um, Cologne meeting in Germany, which is the big international meeting, 100,000 yep. dentists go to that every other year, looks like there's a lot of other CAD CAM players a coming lot. from Korea and Japan. Uh, what yep. made you um, go with E4D and what other CAD CAM companies are, uh, do you see coming down in the future? And tell sure. us, walk us through that decision. Yeah, I mean, when we, when we were looking five years, it was only the two, basically, that were involved. And uh, quite honestly, at that time, so my partners are, are, are not as computer savvy as, as I am, and we really wanted to make sure the software was very, very user-friendly. At the time, the, the E4D software was a lot more um, easy to use than, than the, than the Cerex software, that, that version of Cerex software. Um, we also liked the fact that all, this, uh, all the E4D materials were manufactured in the United States. They have kind of an interesting um, you know, corporate structure where all of the um, 
manufacture R and D educational is all done down just outside of Dallas, Texas. So they've got a, a, an interesting setup there. I, I uh, visited the plant had, and had, had yeah, dinner with the yeah. founder and his wife. His wife's name yeah. was Dottie. Mm, not sure. I met the wife where Basil was the founder, but I've yeah. never met his wife. But uh, yeah, it's it's a very interesting way that they had structured it. So we were we were very impressed with that. Um, you know, the milling technology they seem to have in place looked looked to be very very good. And uh, like I said, really like the software and and the responsiveness of the company. So uh, you know, that was for us a good thing. And then like like I said, the the big issue for us were what materials were available and. You know, thankfully, the the Emacs, which was what we've been using as our workhorse, was available with the um, with the E4D system. So it seemed seemed to be a very good fit, and we've been happy with the decision ever since. They've they've supported us very well. They've handled um, the upgrade path, I think, extremely well. We we've been through now in five years three different iterations of the the camera software, and uh, they've been very fair. We we um, you know, we had to pay for one camera upgrade to go from the the first camera to the second camera. And when the uh, the Nevo, which became the Plan Mecha Plan Scan, came out last year, they actually credited us back the the money we paid for the um, the second camera upgrade towards the the Plan Scan. So I thought that was pretty fair the way they handled it and keeping the the costs in line. They also had a kind of interesting kind of profit structure where they get a royalty on each block uh, per, uh, purchased uh, instead of making a lot of money on the hardware. It seemed like they were very interested in making sure their users were successful. Uh, because they were, had a vested interest in, in us producing a lot of crowns and selling a lot of blocks. So I think that was a, an interesting concept uh, with their company as well. Basel is a class act and, yeah. uh, and in so many ways, whether it be yep. family, marathon runners. I mean, he's just a hell of a guy. I yeah. love that guy. <laughs> I really do. It's, it's an interesting group down there now. And, of course, he's moved on from E4D in the past year or so. Uh, and uh, you know, with Plameca coming in, it's it's been a lot of changes in the past year with with E4D. But um, you know, I think the the Plan Mecca, uh, you know merger in has has been a big help. They've brought a lot of manufacturing expertise, and of course, all their knowledge and imaging and, and software uh, has has really kind of jump started. We've seen a lot of changes just in the past six months or so with how the the software and, and the hardware is being handled. So really looking forward to see what happens in the next you know coming years with with the the company for that sort of stuff. So, Mike, I want to ask you this question. Um, sure. Before CAD CAM, a dentist takes an impression. Yep. Hands it to a lab man. Mm-hmm. Doesn't see it for two weeks. The lab man makes the entire crown. Right. Two weeks later, it walks through the door. But it seems like a lot of dentists, when they get CAD CAM, decide that um, now they're a lab man. Sure. Not, not their assistant. They, they, they optically scan. They're milling. They're staining. They're glazing. Right. And all that stuff. Do you, are you now a lab man with a, a, the CAD cam? Or yeah. do you or, your assistant do this? Or is there just we, one? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it depends upon the cases. But we do, uh, sometimes the assistants will do the design and the, the stain and glaze. Sometimes the docs will. Kind of depends on the timing and, and the type of case we're doing. Uh, but that's one of the nice things about CAD CAM is you can train up your staff and, and delegate stuff to them, which will save you time. It's also a nice way to kind of empower those staff members to do something different instead of, you know, just being chair side and, and, you know, working all day long doing that. It gives them something new and a new challenge. So, And sometimes some of your staff are, are a lot better at staining and glazing than, than the dentists are. They see color sometimes a lot better than you do. So I don't know if I'd necessarily say I'm a lab man. I mean, for, for the kinds of things we do, I think we do a very nice job. Uh, and and we've gotten to the point where we can get a, a very nice result out of out of a, a ceramic block in the office. If I have a very high end cosmetic case, I still am going to send that and, and have a, a dental technician get involved there because you know there's an artistry involved with that in terms of layering uh, porcelains and stuff that we can't do in the office. But for a monolithic restoration, which is is another big uh, uh, part of not just CAD CAM, but part of what's changed in dentistry in the past five years or so, the monolithic restorations, uh, I think we can do a pretty decent job with those in the office and get a, get a very nice result. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's always a tough question is, you know, you're, are you taking the, the job of the, the dental technician and, and bring it into the office? And, you know, uh, that there is a lot of training and skill that goes along with that. But for the simple restorations, I think that this works out very, very well and uh, you can get a very, very nice result. So um, basically, on Dental Town, I'm on Dental Town all day, every day. Oh, yeah. And uh, what um, what what are you seeing growth in your practice? I mean, what what are you doing in this flat, anemic, blah economy? Yeah, I mean, for us, we've been fairly fortunate. The bread and butter kind of dentistry has has held pretty steady for us, um, and the stuff that that has kind of gone and, and faded back has been more of the cosmetic type cases. 
Um, but, you know, I, I, we haven't seen anything we necessarily can say we're, we're going to grow in this area. We're just trying to provide as much service to our existing patient base as possible, making sure we, uh, you know, keep the patients in there for their, for their active recalls and, and making sure we're, we're diagnosing and treating all the, the routine st- uh, dentistry. And that seems to have held pretty steady for us. We've been fairly lucky out here. We haven't been hit quite as bad as, as some areas of the country. So, you know, we haven't added a lot in, although one of the things that we're going to look at uh, is probably maybe to start placing some implants in the office uh, as a as a different uh, avenue to have. And again, this kind of ties back into the technology with uh, the cone beam and the CAD cam to be able to do some of the, the guided surgery procedures. I think that will make it uh, a little more attainable for, for general, general dentists to be placing some implants, probably not all of them, but at least placing some implants in the office. So. Now, would you would you go with the uh, Plan Mecca since they now, they, do they own E4D? Do they buy E4D? Or they they bought a, a, the way it was described to me was it's a non-controlling interest in E4D. So they, they, they're they co-developing products now. Um, you know, we, we actually, before I even got into CAD CAM, we had a, a Plan Mecca Pro Max pan that can be upgraded to CT. So uh, that would be the logical thing for us to do anyway. We would just be to upgrade our, our pan to, to CT capability. It will happen to play play well. Um, the the one thing that's nice about the E4D system is that it is open source and, and the uh, Romexa software that Plan Mecca has that they've integrated the E4D um, software into is all open source. So you can pull anybody's cone beam into that without any problem at all. It's it's Okay, Mike, Mike, a lot yep. of our viewers um, don't understand the difference between open source and what's yep. the opposite of open source. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, basically, I mean... What's when, the opposite when, of open source? The opposite is closed. Um, when you look at it, it, there's, with Serona in particular and some of the manufacturers, um, they basically make it so that uh, it's, it's more difficult for you to import and export uh, files in and out of your system. So if you have, uh, say, a Serona CAD CAM system uh, and you want to use comb beam with it, uh, you, you kind of do have to use a Serona comb beam with it to, to make it, it, it works a lot easier that way. And uh, it's not so simple to do, um, to bring in another comb beam. Same thing if you want to export out files out of, uh, out of uh, a Serona system. Uh, it's not quite as simple. You do have to have a, a special laboratory version of the software and, and pay a little bit of a fee. Whereas some of the software, E4D and, and a lot of the other ones, have a, an open source, which basically means that you can export a, it's a .stl file from your CAD CAM system. Essentially, it's a JPEG version of, of, your, uh, of your CAD CAM files, so it's universal and can be brought into any other software. So if I, for instance, were to send a uh, scan of one of my cases um, that I don't want to manufacture in the office to a laboratory uh, in the STL format, they can then pull that STL file into a three-shape software and mill it on a three-shape mill if they if it's something big or any any other piece of software, any other mill they want to use. So Now, are you doing that with... Um, um like, do you do that very often, or do you do, you do that Some, with bridges instead of an impression? Yeah, or yeah, sometimes we will. Uh, not not every single time, but uh, a lot of times we will send that kind of stuff uh, via uh, STL file to the laboratories and do it that way. Uh, and what it, what lab are you using that accepts that the file? Right now, uh, I'm using a lab down in Texas called Cosmetic Advantage Dental uh, that uh, a guy named Jimmy Fincher runs down there. And so we send stuff down to him. So um, cos- cosmeticadventure.com? Cosmetic Advantage Dental. Cosmeticadvantagedental.com? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, but uh, again, where, where it's an open file, I, I know that, you know, you could send it off to a big lab like Glidewell or Microdental or any of these other labs uh, could take those files and can, can open those up and, and, and work with them as well. So it's very simple for, for the user to take an, an open file from their CAD CAM and, and send it off to anybody, whereas you have to do some conversion process um, when it's a closed system. So it's a little bit more of, of work to, to do that way. But So I, I'm a pretty firm believer that, that, your, that your CAD CAM, if you're using a digital impression from CAD CAM system, it should function the same way as uh, a physical impression. So if I take a, an impression with Aquasil or Impergum, it shouldn't matter. I should be able to send it to whatever lab I want. It should be the same with your, your CAD CAM. If you're taking a digital impression, 
I really think you should be able to just send it off to the lab and let the laboratory technician and you decide how that, that you're going to use that digital model uh, to, to take, take care of your patients so rather than having to jump through a bunch of hoops. So that's why I think the open source uh, thing is, is, is gaining steam and you see most of the newer systems that have come out in the past year, you talked about all the systems that are coming, they're all having some version of, of a .stl export kind of built right into the software now. Yeah, and, and tell us about some of these systems with names uh, for our viewers. Uh, CareStream is, is probably one of the bigger ones that came out, which is the remnants of the Kodak company that sold off uh, a few years back. They've got a, a, a scanner that, that's hit the market about a year or so ago that looks pretty interesting. Um, now, Three Shape Trios has got a very, very nice scanner as well. Probably one of the more expensive scanners on the market, but one of the nicer scanners on the market. Uh, that one has been very nice. Um, Kodak, uh, 3M... Uh, has had scanners for a while. They're one of the actually the first uh, company to have a, a live video scanner, and they have uh, a new version actually coming out. Uh, I think this fall of their um, uh, their scanner as well. Um, so that that's something interesting to look forward to as well. So th there's a lot of companies, and what you're seeing is that a lot of these major manufacturers. In fact, if you look at Plan Meco when they they were distributing E4D over in Europe for a while because they didn't have a scanner. They they all seem to want to have one now because they see that the future of of impressioning is is digital. It's not going to be physical impressions probably for a whole lot longer, uh, at least for for a lot of things. So, and why um, is that? Tell, tell people why you think that it's going to go from physical polyether polyvinyl to yeah. optical scanning. Yeah, well, it, it's it's faster. I mean, all, and all, when you look at laboratories right now, laboratories have converted to a digital uh, 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 workflow already. So when you get your um, a case, even if you send a stone model off to a, one of the big commercial labs now, they're taking that, scanning it in, and then going ahead and either doing a CAD version of, of your restoration or they're, they're printing or, or um, milling out waxes to... to to go ahead and do restorations that way if they need to cast or press or something that way. So the, the, the technology is moving that way on the laboratory side. On the dental side, it's much faster. I mean, I can, the scans are pretty quick. I can get scans done very quickly now, probably quicker than the impression material takes to set. It's more comfortable for the patient. They don't have to have the impression material in the mouth for, you know, two, three minutes, whatever the set time is. And now I can digitally send that uh, file off to the lab right away. It, it's going to be there in, you know, however long it takes to upload the case rather than having to ship the case uh, both ways, so you cut your shipping down. Um, and it, uh, so it, it, uh, it's all overall a lot, a lot nicer. You, it, then you also can get feedback immediately. If, if, I, if you take that big bridge impression and you know, you got maybe six abutments you're trying to pick up, and you take a physical impression, you get a bubble right on the margin. Well, you got to take that whole impression over again. Whereas with digital, if you go back and, and you see, oh, I missed a little bit of data on you know this particular abutment, you can just go back and scan a little bit more in that spot, add that data back in, and you, and you don't have to retake the entire impression. So there are a lot of advantages to it, um, you know, being able to manipulate those digital models. Plus, you're also now able to, to save those models. Uh, none of us are saving every model from every case we ever do because we'd need to have warehouses attached to our offices. But with the uh, hard drive space, you know, becoming extremely cheap and, and, a, and a small you know, unit, uh, you can actually save all those uh, digital impressions for however long you want to and be able to go back to them in, in the event you need to. So there's a lot of advantages to the digital impressioning. Um, I think, though, the, the real power, though, is, is to have the chair side in, in the office in conjunction because the, the return on investment for the dentist, I think, really comes when you're able to do the, the chair side uh, you know, same day dentistry in the office because that's where you're gonna you realize the savings in the laboratory bill and 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 uh, you know the one visit for the patient, which is a bit of a marketing opportunity for you. Uh, so those you'll have with the the um, the milling in the office, but you won't have that necessarily with just digital impressioning. So uh, you know, different uh, different different ways to go about having that technology in the office. But I do think you're going to see the the change. It's just it's you. you when you see all these big manufacturers lining up and, and all introducing similar products, you know that's you know some writing on the wall there. They've, they've done market research. They see where the market is going as well. So you're initially you said you, you don't do surgery. You don't do nope. wisdom teeth or place implants. But then yep. you alluded to the fact that you're thinking about yep. uh, making well, – I, I assume that's um, – CBCT uh, surgical yep. guides to where it's a lot sure. easier to place them. Can you talk about that? And yeah. Where, where's I mean, your mind at with that decision now? Yeah, right now I, I, I'm probably just about to pull the trigger on it. Um, you know, I, I definitely, you know, this is something I think that we'll see a lot happening in the next couple of years because, you know, general dentists, they, they do need to add, add procedures. And, and implant placement, you know, isn't really, really hard if you have 
a, a well-planned surgery uh, from what I understand. So the, the uh, ability to have, if you have the tools in the office, if you have the, the CAD CAM, if you have the comb beam, uh, the, I think the key thing, uh, the, one of the things that kind of always um, concerns me whenever I'm doing an implant cases is sometimes you'll get those cases back from your surgeon and they're not, you know, ideally placed. And I've always been a believer in that the, um, uh, the placement of that implant really should be driven by the position of the final restoration. So to be able to take your CAD CAM and, and design that final restoration prior to surgery, use the cone beam to be able to see where that bone is and, and can, can you place this implant in a, in a position that will allow you to, uh, to have this restoration and, and then make your tweaks and make all that planning ahead of time. So there's no surprises three months later when you uncover that implant, you know exactly where, where things are, are going to be. Um, and if you have, if you're able to, you know, do all this and have a surgical guide uh, that's going to prevent you from kind of getting yourself in trouble, and you have foam beams, so you're able to really see in three dimensions, you know, the anatomy, making sure you're not going to be close to a sinus or a nerve or something that that's a, a concern. I think that would will give that maybe isn't so surgically oriented uh, to place at least some some simple cases where you've got plenty of bone and and you're able to. To, uh, to locate those implants in, in a good location without getting close to any vital structures. So I think that's something that we'll see more and more general dentists becoming involved uh, because the technology is just going to make it a lot, a lot simpler and safer for them to do it, much more predictable. And you say you're about ready to pull the trigger on exactly yeah. what, the software or the uh, – what, what do you no, – we'll, prob- Well, probably to upgrade our, um, to our, our Panorex to, uh, to comb beam to get the, uh, the upgrade done. I've already – I've gotten quotes, and we're, I think we're just about ready to, to move on that in the next year. We've got a, an interesting setup. I'm in a professional building where we have in our building a periodontist, an oral surgeon, and an orthodontist as well. Uh, part of why I don't do a lot of surgery because I've got a great surgeon right upstairs. But um, we also we, we actually uh, share in on, on the, the PAN. We've, we've networked that Panorex into a digital Panorex into multiple practitioners' offices. And we'll do the same with the cone beam. We'll be able to do that and share the cost of that as well. So it makes it much more economical for all of us to have the technology without having to invest, you know, full, you know, put the full amount of money into it. But we'll all, all have access to it uh, for a, a pretty reasonable cost. So that uh, I think we'll probably try to get that done by the end of the year and, and get that get that taken care of. And then it's just a matter of uh, finding some training courses and getting comfortable with uh, an implant system. So, and have, have you have you um, found any training courses, some hands-on training courses that you're I, looking at? I've looked at a couple. I mean, there, there's it, it's interesting. It seems that there's kind of two different. There's some of the, some of these interesting courses I see online where they take you down into, you know, down at the island someplace, Dominican or something, and you place like a boatload of implants over. a over about a week period of time, that looks very, very interesting. Uh, that I think something like that might be. Might are you be talking well. about? Are you talking about Aaron Garg down in Dominican yeah. Republic? Yep, exactly. That that one looks pretty interesting. What, what's his website? What's what's his company's name? You know, I'm not positive on that. Uh, okay, well, I'll, no, so. I'll I'll find it and add it to the podcast notes. Yeah. And, what, and what's the other school? Uh, that you're thinking about? Classroom lecture. Yeah, there there are different there are different lectures and and. Um, you know, a more classroom-based kind of stuff with some hands-on, and I'm just trying to debate whether it's you know because it's fairly expensive to do the the week-long course. So I've got to see if I can find something that that will will meet my needs without having to go that far. But we'll we'll, we'll take a look. That's that'll be you know the next step is just kind of figure out the uh, the training aspect of it. You but, know what that reminds me of though, being uh, 52. Uh, yeah. me- remember back in the day um, when RK came out and everyone was afraid to do it on an American who in a country with one million attorneys. <laughs> So right. everyone was flying to Moscow. Yeah. And yeah. there was a guy in Moscow that, I mean, I, I think he did like 40, 50,000 of them before anybody had done 10 in America uh, wow. because he didn't have the, the, the legal environment. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It yeah. does make a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you would be optically scanning, sending the file to a lab and milling out a surgical guide, or would you be milling out yeah. your own surgical guide? No, they, 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 that would go to a laboratory. We, we don't, uh, yeah. In fact, nobody's really necessarily milling out a surgical guy right now. You can mill a components to them, and they, there's still some hand, hand work even with some of the in-office guides that I've seen. Uh, so, no, this would be sent out to the laboratory with, uh, you know, with a, a metal sleeve and, uh, you know, drill stops and all that kind of stuff so that we'd be able to be real precise what we're doing. So, yeah, there's, there's several different, different laboratories that are out there, and you know, the prices aren't ridiculous. About $200 is what I've seen a, a, on average for a surgical guide, and I'm betting that price is probably going to drop a little bit as you get more and more dentists getting involved with the technology uh, and placing these. But, uh, and what's, and what's also, that, you know, 
What's also amazing is many of the oral surgeons I know that are legendary yep. have now gone to 100% surgical guides because they're referring yep. doctor. They say, you know, if I if I place 100 implants for you and 15 of them, 50, just 10% aren't quite right, yeah. you're only going to remember the 10% that's not right. You're not going to remember that, the 90% that's straight on. And that's so true. they would rather just bullseye every single one of them yep. so you're always yep. happy. So they're yep. doing this even though they're I, I phenomenal agree. surgeons. I'd agree. I mean, in the in the days when when CT technology was was very uncommon, and you maybe had to send the patient to the hospital and get a CT done there, and the radiation dose was really high, and it was hard to justify doing that for every single patient. But uh, where the technology is is there, the radiation dose is low. It's not you know it's not going to add much cost to the procedure to get that reliability and predictability. Seems to make an awful lot of sense to me to go, you know, go guided with with all these cases. So. That's something that, that I'll definitely be looking to do with my surgeons uh, as, as we go forward. Now, you're, uh, I want to thank you not only for all you've done for dentistry, but for Dentaltown. Uh, you're an administrator yep. on the Dentaltown Forum. Talk about yes. that. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it, that's interesting. I mean, it, it's um, something that we've been doing for about uh, two years. I initially was brought in to kind of moderate all the, the E4D uh, forums and, and some of the other technology forums. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's uh, it's. You know, it sometimes it gets a little hairy and crazy, but for the most part, I think since since Howard Goldstein has kind of taken over and kind of set the rules out, um, things have been been pretty common. We we don't have to do a whole heck of a lot anymore. In the old Wild West days, when you had the endo forums going crazy and the E4D and Seric people going at each other, there was a lot more where you'd have to edit and you know kind of keep things under control. But nowadays, it's it's not too too bad. Occasionally, we get. get and I I want to I want to um, that's fantastic feedback, and that is a hundred percent my fault because when I started Dental Town in '98, yeah, um, I was a registered libertarian. I thought <laughs> these dentists all have eight years of college; they're all adults. Right. It's I'm not going to go in there and police. <laughs> and I didn't really comprehend yeah. cyberbullying, and yeah. now and now um, you see them talking about that in the news. At the elementary school, the high school. I know in Phoenix, when you're bullying another student, the, the teachers call the police. And right. and um, it just just takes not even one tenth of one percent of these crazy cyber bully people to go right. on Facebook or Dental Town or Twitter yeah. or whatever and just say the craziest, meanest things. And we so we brought in Howard Goldstein, and yeah. he said, "Look, we're, you're going to talk. Um, the rules are that." Um, Dental Town is not um, the government. A lot of people say it's freedom of speech. Now, freedom yeah. of speech in the Constitution is between you and the government. Right. You don't you don't have your right to come into my house and have right. your freedom of speech. And Dental Town is my house, and right. you're going to talk to each other like you're a party at Howard's house. And right. and gentlemen can disagree, but they do it in yeah. a nice way. And yep. if you're not nice, go play somewhere else. And Absolutely. Howard Goldstein is really uh, and he's he's been there doing that for three years now. Yeah, and it, it, it it's a different environment. You can see it is a different environment, and I think it, it's important to have that environment because you want to encourage people to be able to post, and you know, especially a younger dentist who, you know, they need they're, they're going to want to learn, and learning from your peers is great. So to be able to post a case and say, "Boy, I'm having trouble with this," and to get just some good constructive feedback versus you know a lot of negative feedback, I think is helpful because I know that when people get that negative feedback as their first or second. Um, you know, experience online, then they're gonna, they're just going to go away. They're gonna they're not going to come back. So you won't want to have people coming out and asking questions, being feeling feeling free to do so without having a lot of you know kind of crazy criticism. So I think that that's a very helpful thing. And right. And, and what what I saw them. and what I saw is like you you say you use Apex Dental. So you know yep. what I like to see if you have a question about Apex Dental about how right. you're using Surpass, you, I don't want to hear nine people say, oh well, you should be using this product. And right. and one of the problems with that with the E4D is that if anybody posts the E4D case, that someone would get on and say, "Well, you should have bought another another system." It's like right, exactly. that, that's not the question. We're past right. that decision. Let's talk right. about this Let's decision. About, yeah. So that was one of the things when we, when I first kind of got involved, we were dealing with was a lot of that, and uh, we, Howard kind of came up with the concept of we're going to have one thread and one thread only, where you can kind of compare and bash and, and do whatever you want. Uh, between the two systems, but otherwise we're going to have two forums where you can discuss the problems and, and issues you're having. And one of my points with the you know the folks from the Seric posters you know early on was, hey, you know, once we get to the point of having this crown on machine, we're all doing the same thing. So in terms of staining, glazing, and bonding, and characterization, and all that stuff that that goes on after you get past the mill, uh, and also preparation and all that sort of thing, there's a lot in common that we could help each other out with. So. That was kind of my point, and that seems to have happened now is where you see some cross-pollination where you've got people using the different systems kind of commenting 
to users from the other one. It's a question where there can be some input because there's a lot of commonality. I mean, it really, the technology is a little bit different, but in the in the end, you're you're doing about the same thing. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to some more more details. So are you doing a shoulder prep with two millimeters all the way around? Do you like uh, is that what you're liking? I'm I'm doing a modified shoulder, but not two millimeters all the way around. Probably more like a millimeter or so all the way around. We use and, one millimeter. Yeah, one millimeter is about all. That's that's what the specs are for Emacs is about a millimeter, maybe a little more. It depends on obviously what's missing. If you got a a big cusp that's come off, you're, you're gonna maybe shoulder out a little bit more where the the fracture is. Well, the and nice how things, much how much occlusal reduction. 1.5 millimeters. So one and a half on the top and yep. one millimeter all the way around? All the way around, yeah, pretty much. Is in a, in and, a, and a shoulder? You said a modified shoulder? Modified shoulder. So basically that's just a shoulder, but the, the burr has got a, the corner of the burr is rounded because you want to have all your internal line angles rounded. So it's just a, instead of a, a flat straight cylinder, you've got a little bit of a rounding on the end of the, of the end of the burr. So it just modify, rolls out that internal line angle from the shoulder. So we do a lot of that, and you know the the of course the nice one of the nice things with CAD CAM is you're able to to save a little more to structure, try to keep things uh, you know super gingival when we can, and uh, you know do more maybe more a little more on layer crown lay type preparations, so we're not uh, taking away to structure if we don't have to. That's that's another nice thing stuff that you wouldn't be able to, to temporize with a conventional crown and bridge. So you're able to do it same day when you're easily bonding right away. So and, and some, back to stating yeah. glazing. Um, okay. So, so what, what percent of the market would you say um, America's got a uh, 150,000 dentists, 30,000 are specialists, 120 general dentists yep. of those 120,000 general dentists. What percent of those do you think are already at CAD cam? Oh, it's probably, I bet it's less than 10% at this point. Agree. So nine yeah. out of 10 don't have one of these nope. machines. And you just said something that probably frightened a lot of them. You said staining and glazing. And yep. a lot of dentists might say, like, "Oh my God, oh, I I, I, I'm not going to stain and glaze." Yeah, cool. this is crazy. The my, yep. well, what's Mike talking about? Talk about yep. stain and glazing. What percent needs stain and glazing? Is this something you do? Does I, your I mean, assistant I, do it? How much time yeah. does this take you? It take it doesn't take very long at all. I do a lot of it myself, to be honest. I kind of enjoy doing it. it it's not that hard. I mean, it literally takes, you know, maybe about two minutes to to stain and glaze a crown, put it in the oven. It, it's really simple. We have, you know, the the um, uh, the stains are pretty simple to apply. There's some nice spray glazes that are out there that are very, very simple to use. Take you like a, a you know, couple seconds to spray on the glaze and you're good to go. So, you know, you're, you're, you're able to do these uh, with a little bit of practice um, w without too much trouble. So, yeah, it is scary, but, um, you know, we, we all are pretty good with our hands. And like, like I said, the other op opportunity, too, is if you've got a, a talented dental assistant in the office, a lot of times... Uh, that your assistants can be can be trained up to be very very good at at doing stain and glaze as well. So I wouldn't let that scare you. It is it is one of the when it, whenever I um, you know get feedback from from new users, that's one of the things they always seem to be nervous about or having trouble with is the stain and glaze part of it. But after you've done you know a hundred units or so, it becomes second nature. It really isn't that hard to do. We we do much more difficult stuff every day with general dentistry. So so you and I are, are different schools of camp because um. I figured, you know, my, my first, you know, decade or so, I sent a rubber impression to the lab, so they yep. did all that. And right. so when I brought in CAD CAM, I, I had my four assistants, Jan, Yoni, Millie, Christina, um, they do it all. So, yep. so would you say the difference between me and you, you just enjoy doing that yeah. more? And I, I just, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's it, that's the nice thing about this. Whatever fits into your practice style, you know, everyone's going to have a little different take on things in terms of how you uh, incorporate this kind of technology into your practice. So for me, I like to do the stain and glaze. It takes me just a couple minutes to do. Other guys, yeah, they just assume let the assistant do it. They, you know, they, they, their time they can be off doing something else that they'd rather do more productive. Um, so you can you can kind of do however however you uh, works best for you and your practice. So okay, more 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 more, more specifics from you. So you. You personally, not your hygienist partners. How many chairs do you, does Mike work? I just work a single chair. Um, you know, you I, I only work, work a single chair. Single so chair. So if yep. so if I um I, I I've actually <laughs> I've had two I had two crowns this year, and you're not going to yep. believe that you're not going to believe the story. If I I shouldn't even tell the story because no one will believe it. I went to my favorite restaurant, ordered the salmon with, but it has peppercorn on it. Yep. Okay. A bit down on a peppercorn and an mod. Yep. Boom. Yep. Same restaurant, same dish. A month later, same peppercorn, another molar. Boom. Okay. Oh my. So, so, um, um, so now I'm ordering it without peppercorn. I've I've learned that. But I, it, I would so, guess. So if I if I was scheduled with Mike, 
Uh, I busted, uh, I had an MOD, busted off a cusp. I'm coming in for yep. a crown. How All much right. time would you schedule me? And what, walk, walk, at, walk the 90% of dentists who aren't in CAD CAM. Um, yeah. how, long, so, how long did you used to schedule that person in a chair when you took right. a polyether okay. or polyvinyl versus now? Yeah, I mean, typically what I used to do was to schedule for a, a, nine, a 90-minute uh, crown prep impression temporary visit and then for 30 minutes for the insert, uh, you know, a couple weeks later. Um, now so what I'll hours. do is, Yeah, so two hours. Now I'll, I'll still schedule for two hours, but it's all in one, one visit. And most times I'm probably done in about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, you know, between an hour and a half and an hour and 45 is my average time for CAD CAM restoration. And what we'll do is, you know, we have uh, – your patient will come in anesthetize them like normal um we'll go ahead and what are you anesthetizing with lidocaine septicaine Sept septicaine most of the time okay yep. what percent of the time is septicaine well probably 90 percent of the time basically only time i'll use something other would be if i have a patient maybe with a, a uh, sensitivity to epinephrine uh or if it's a very short procedure and i don't want to i'll use something with no epinephrine just to so they won't be numb as long but the septicaine's worked really well for us so we okay so you're numb with septicaine then you're yep. gonna prep uh, well, first, while they're, while they're anesthetizing, we'll go ahead and pre-op scan the opposing arch. Uh, if we're going to uh, copy the existing crown or, or, or tooth, we can uh, go ahead and sc uh, scan the pre-op of the prep tooth and uh, be able to kind of clone that tooth onto the instead of designing a clone tooth and, and drop it right onto the prep later on. So we'll get those scans done ahead of time. And then go okay. ahead and do our preparation. Yep. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, but what percent no. of the, what percent of the time are you going to clone the existing tooth, and what percent would you not? And what 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 is your what are you thinking yeah. to clone or not to clone? Right. My my if uh, okay. So if I'm going to clone it, it would have to be that I like what's already there. So if I have a, an existing crown or existing restoration that looks decent, that, that fits the occlusion properly, uh, has good anatomy, then I'll go ahead and clone it. It's probably a very small percentage of the time, though, because usually when we're doing a crown, it's a tooth that's got a big old MOD L amalgam that's broken off a cusp or got recurrent carry. I'll always clone existing partial denture rings with CAD CAM same day. Is that you can take the existing tooth if you've got a partial denture that's fitting to an existing <laughs> crown or tooth, you can go ahead and clone that, and it's the best way we. We've seen for making an existing partial fit a new crown, uh, so that that one we're 100 percent of the time going to clone. If we have some oddball anatomy, a lot of rotations or missing, you know, teeth or something crazy that we that, we're, that the library teeth aren't going to fit well to, we'll clone that as well. That's a small percent. So uh, most of the time, quicker and easier to use the library teeth and and, and go from there, and it'll come out with a better result. So, um, so it's a pretty small percent. And so once we have the the, the um, pre-op scan saying, yeah, it's just go ahead and prep like usual. Uh, I still use a two-cord technique for, for tissue okay, I'm, retraction. I'm going to back you up on the prep. Um, yeah. Because yeah. because my, my podcasts are downloaded at all age groups from dental students out of school around the world. So walk, yep. walk through the prep. Do you use a, a different bird to break contact? How many birds do you use? And walk us through your prep. Sure. I, I use primarily four burrs. Uh, what I'm going to do first is to do occlusal reduction with a – and I, I'm going to use – these are going to be all – Microcopy one use uh, diamonds uh, that I'm going to use. I'm going to use microcopy. Uh, yep, microcopy the the single use burrs. Uh, so I'm going to use a, a football shaped diamond to reduce my occlusion initially. Do you use depth guides? No, I don't actually. I, I've got a. Well, I'll, um, so what I use to check my my uh, depth is um, I use something called a prep check. Common sense dental makes it's a little rubber um, wing shaped deal, and it they come in three different sizes. There's a one millimeter, one point five, and a two. And it's got powder on it, and the, the green is the 1.5, which I'll use. And once I've got my occlusal reduction established, you place one of those in between the teeth, have the patient tap on it. Any spots where you're not reduced by 1.5, it'll leave a little green powder on the tooth, and you'll be able to just prep away that one spot. So it's Nice. And who makes that? That's uh, Common Sense Dental. CommonSenseDental.com. Okay, so, yeah. so you're, so you're going to use a football, reduce a millimeter what? and a half. Millimeter but, and a half. And then before axial, before yeah. you broke contacts? Yeah, before I break contact, I'll do that, and then I'll go ahead and uh, and use a uh, my modified shoulder burr, usually like a a, a point one eight uh, modified shoulder burr. Go around and and get the buckle and the lingual. A I'll point, drop down. Did you lingual. say point eight or one point eight? Point one eight. Point one eight. Yeah. Point, point one eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, and then I'll and then I'll go down and, and break through the contact with a thinner, maybe a flame shape vertebrae contact, and uh, go ahead refine the preparation. Uh, get you know once I've got contact broken and a rough shape done, I'll place uh, maybe a size one ultra dent knitted cord uh, to get the tissue out of the way. I'll finish my 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 shaping with uh, the coarse burr, and then uh, I'll take a fine uh, modified shoulder burr. Uh, and just you know refine the margins. That's one thing with CAD CAM preparations. The margins need to be nice and smooth. You can't leave kind of rough uh, margins with 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 uh, chips on the edges of them. It has to be nice and smooth because mill the mill can only mill down to a certain level. The, the burst the burst size dictates how small it can mill to. So if you're leaving a lot of irregular margins, you'll have troubles with marginal fit. So if you just got to smooth that down real nice, round over all the line angles, and so that'll be the preparation step there. But that I'll, I'll spend. A lot of time, I'm I'm probably a little slow of preparation uh, compared to some guys, but I want to make sure that prep looks really, really nice, so that, that you know the lab is either lab or the mill is going to have an easy time with it, uh, and that so that'll that'll take me well. And that's right now with, with my restorations, that's the only part that tends to vary. So, if, of that you know hour and forty five minute visit, you know. Uh, the, what's going to dictate whether that's a short visit or a long visit is going to be that preparation stage. You know, if you're chasing you, carries down. You said yep. two cord, but you only mentioned placing the one cord by alternate. Right. So after I've finished the preparation, I'll place a number two cord for tissue retraction before scanning. Okay. So they'll, and, they'll and, place that. And w are you doing this with uh, your naked eye or are you wearing oh, magnif no. magnification? <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't do anything with my naked eyes anymore. It's <laughs> it's four X loops with with a with a light. 4X. I've got the surgical tell. Yeah, four X surgical tells and uh, the Lumident lights, which I've been using the past couple of years, which I like a lot. Uh, Lu those, Lumident lights. Yeah, yeah, Lumident lights are awesome. Those. those now are, you, very, you've been you've been doing dentistry twenty one years. How many years yep. of that was four X? Did you start loops at four X? Oh did no, you... I I started at two point five probably. Maybe 15 years ago. So I, I practiced without loops for maybe five or six years, and then I then I started. I got my first <laughs> pair of two fives, and quickly jumped from two fives up to to the fours that I have right now. And I can't even do a hygiene check without loops anymore. Just, I know. Just I just amazing. go into I go into office after office after office. And what what percent of dentists would you say do not wear loops? Jeez, I, you know, I, I would hope it would be close to zero, but I'm guessing it's not. <laughs> oh my it, gosh, it's just yeah, it's it, yeah, it's it's, yeah, it, it's hardly used. And and then yeah. another thing that's that's neat that we've been doing this uh <clears throat> this many years is then seeing your prep. I mean, you, you're watching oh. forex, but then you see your prep on a screen, and you're like, yep. when, I, I remember when I first started seeing my preps on my screen, I like I, I was like I was shocked. Yeah, you, yeah. Do you remember that experience? I, I absolutely do, and and it, it's one of those those aha moments where you look at it and say, "Oh my gosh, I I can do a lot better." And like I said, I, I, every time I when I went from and they say, "Well, you're going to get this magnification; it'll help you get better." What they don't tell you is it's going to slow you down a lot, a little bit too, because you're going to see things you didn't see before, and you're going to spend time trying to perfect what you weren't perfecting before. So, and and, and yeah, I've always wondered, I've always wondered how big, I mean, I know I, I use three and a half loops, but how, yeah. how many X do you think we're looking at on that screen? Oh, uh, it's gotta be 20 or 30 X by the time you re cause I mean, you're, you know, you're scrolling in and really blow, you're marking your margins. You're scrolling and blowing that up really big. So you're taking it way, way up in magnification. So you're seeing a lot and it's, it's humbling at first. You start looking, like you said, you look at your preparation, you say, oh my gosh, my margins could be a lot smoother than that. Uh, so you, it'll force you to kind of slow down and take your time and make sure that's done correctly. But it, it's better. I mean, you're, you're doing okay, a better so, job. Okay. So you're, you're done prepping with your diamonds. You pack yep. a second cord. Yep. Um, do you, do you go in there with a, say any, a soft flex disc or do you, do you, yep. A lot of times I will, uh, you know, if there's adjacent uh, restorations, I'll, you know, go ahead and disc those adjacent restorations, make sure they're nice and smooth. Uh, you know, if I've got maybe some, you know, undercuts or something on the adjacent teeth, I'll, you know, you'll, you'll take, you got a couple minutes where you were in for that cord. So, yeah, uh, very often I'll take some Soflex discs and just polish down the adjacent teeth and make sure there aren't any r rough, ragged spots that, that need to be smoothed out because, yeah, you want nice smooth margins. You would have done that with, with any, whether you're doing CAD CAM or whether you're doing traditional dentistry with that. And so now you're going to optically scan. Yep. And then and, and keep, so keep going. Yeah. So we'll optically scan the case, and probably for uh, your average, uh, you know, uh, single unit case, that's probably takes about a minute and a half to optically scan and get. You know, you're going to scan the, the the preparation tooth and and a neighbor or two on either side just for the system to get the occlusion. And about a minute and a half of, of scanning time to to get up all that that information. 
and uh, so you'll scan the prep side and then um, you'll do a buckle bite from there basically what a buckle bite means is you've got you've already got the opposing arch scanned in pre-op you'll scan the the uh, prep side uh, during that the next step and then uh, to get the articulation you have the patient you know bite down and you'll scan basically uh, an, a digital scan of the teeth interdigitated and the software uses that to line up the upper and lower model and give you the um, the articulation so you you get that done and um, you know from there you're just going on to design you'll, you'll go on uh, to uh, mark your margins uh, which again you can zoom in and really look close with the uh, e4d we have a a version of the the model that's called ice which is basically a, a real high-res black and white version so you can really see the 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 edge of the margin and you'll go ahead and mark that uh, with a little tracing tool and from there it's just a matter of uh, you're, mark you're marking the prep with that yep prep prep is marked in before, and you before you optically scan no, 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 marking, after the optical scans are done, that, that's, you're going to, just to mark the margin for the software. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you mark, mark the margins, and uh, you also want to set an orientation. Basically, the, the way these systems work is they have a library shape of teeth for, for the different, uh, you know, tooth positions. And what happens is that based on the orientation of the model, like how you've scanned it, it's going to drop that that model uh, the the uh, the library tooth on top of your your preparation model. So you're going to orient the model so it matches up to the um, to the library tooth so everything aligns up properly. Uh, and then you go ahead and drop it in. The software then will kind of give you a proposal design. And it'll probably take me about you know, two two to three minutes usually to take the computer's proposal and modify that, get the contacts, the the occlusion, everything proper. Check the material thickness, which is another nice thing with the um, the CAD CAM is you're going to check your material thickness before you mill, so you know right away if, if you've got enough space, uh, enough a proper thickness for for strength of the material. So one thing I think most dentists it just typically will will under reduce a lot of preparations, and you find that out pretty quick when you start doing CAD CAM because now that the the mistakes that 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 your lab technician was covering for you with. Uh, you know, trying to have to, to make a restoration that fits into you know 0.8 millimeters when you really needs a millimeter or you know a millimeter and a half, you now have to deal with that. So you do that enough times, and you say, "Well, wait a second, I'm not. That's hard work having to make that restoration fit. I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself enough reduction so that I don't have to do that again." So uh, you know, you go ahead and, and do that. Uh, the design design is is fairly quick. Uh, then the crown will get sent. The proposal gets sent off to the milling unit through through Wi-Fi. And it takes about ten or fifteen minutes to mill out the restoration from the Emax block. Uh, so you're and, gonna you're gonna take a shade. Yep. Take and a how, shade and how many how many how many shades of blocks do you have in your office? We basically uh, we have it, it's the entire Vita range basically uh, all the A's yeah, all the A's B's and C's and D's, a couple bleach shades and different translucencies. You got lo low translucency and high translucency depending upon the prep style. So that you're so using. It, you have only Emax blocks. Or we have Emacs, and we also have some. We have uh, the Empress blocks as well. I use Empress a lot in the interior. Empress is a really nice material for the interior. Now, uh, Ema not, Emacs is um, also um, Ivoclar. Yep, Ivoclar. Yeah, Emacs. So, and so Empress you're using I Williams, Ivoclar, Emacs, and yep. Empress. And Empress. Yep. And occasionally, I'll use uh, some Lava Ultimate, the three M product, but only for onlays and and stuff like that. I won't use that for full crowns quite yet. And why is that? Uh, there's been some issues, a lot of reports of debonding uh, with the, uh, the 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 3M Lava Ultimate. It's it's a it's a it's really a composite resin on a stick. It's basically a Filtex Supreme is, is what it is, but it's on on a stick. There's a lot of flex to it, or a reasonable amount of flex to it, uh, which is good and bad. And the bad of the flex, unfortunately, is that if you put that in a full crown situation and put enough cycles of compression on that. Uh, eventually, that's going to flex the bond, and, and you're going to you're seeing some debonds as a result. So, like I said, for onlays and inlays, it seems to work well because it doesn't come under complete flex. You you have the tooth in there as well, a lot of tooth structure, and those seem to be holding up very very well. Uh, but for um, for full crown full coverage crowns, I've, I've I've heard enough stories of people having issues with them bond, the bond failing that. I'm going to hold off on that for for now, and and Emacs is is a good material too. The nice advantage with lava, though, is you don't have to fire it, you don't have to stain and glaze it. It's just you just polish it right out of the mill, so it's a quicker pr process. So uh, you know, there's there's definitely advantages there. But uh, for me, full crowns, eh, still not quite there with that yet. But for for and online, that's what and, and walk our listener through when when are you going with Empress versus Emacs? 
Yeah, Empress, I, I like to use if, if it's in the interior, because uh, one, the, the Empress, they have the Empress multi-block, which is, a, you know, when we talk about uh, these mono, these are monolithic restorations, so it's one shade of material for the most part with, with Emacs, but they do have an Empress multi-block that actually has different uh, translucencies built right into the block. So you're actually able to, in the software, position uh, where, where you want to cut that restoration out of the block. So if you want more or less translucency, you can move the restoration within the block, and then that, that restoration is going to have some built-in translucency uh, towards the incisal edge if you'd like it there, and also a gradation of color as you, as you move from the gingival up to the incisal. So for an anterior restoration, I think it gives you a, better, uh, a little better aesthetic. It's not as strong, but... It's a material I've used in the interior for a lot of years, a lot of good results. So, so give uh, give give me some percentages. If it was a woman, uh, four yep. maxillary incisors, what percent yep. of it would be? And, and that would, that'd be a hundred percent Empress multi block for 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 four for anterior crowns. I'd I'd use Empress every time, unless I had really dark preparations I was trying to block out. In which case, I would go with Emacs uh, with the LT Emacs because that can block out a. So if you had an endo tooth in there that was discolored. Then you'd have to use the um, the Emacs with that. Okay, but I want to I, I want to change gears now because yep. I only have the luxury of you for five more minutes. Okay. Um, so you and I are both big CAD CAM fans, big time. Yep. Um, nine out of ten dentists in America don't have one, right. and uh, and of the two million dentists around the world, it'd probably be ninety nine percent of the two million don't have one. Probably. Yeah. So so you got you got four and a half minutes. Tell them why they should go CAD CAM. Well, I think number one is that you you bring control of the restorative process into the office. Uh, you're able to to get everything done in that one visit. You control the the quality of the margin. You control the quality of the the shape and uh, the aesthetic of the restoration. Uh, it'll allow you to do everything uh, in one visit, which your patients are gonna like an awful lot. Uh, they don't like to have temporaries. They don't like to have to come back for a second visit and get numbed up a second time. So it's a, a plus there. And you're going to save money uh, in terms of your laboratory costs. It, it's just there's no two ways about that. Uh, and the does, third the, thing, does, the, does the saved laboratory costs make up for the payment on a, on a 60 month uh, payment plan yeah. on, a, on a CAD CAM? For our office, it was yeah, easily. With, with three dentists, it wasn't even a close call. Uh, for even for a single dentist office, I think for the most part you're going to see that savings. Uh, you know, it, it all depends on how many units of Crown and Bridge you're doing a, a month that you're going to be able to do with your CAD CAM. What your laboratory cost was. You have, you know, you'd have to sit down. Everybody's individually going to have to look at that those numbers. But I think on average, for most practices, that you're going to see that that break even point is going to be attainable. Um, you know, there is uh, some changes to how you, you'll practice, but. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it does add something new to the practice. It, it gives you, uh, you know, it, it gets routine after a while. You, you you know, you don't want to be doing the exact same thing for your entire entire career. It also is a nice thing for your staff. It gives them something new to do as well. Uh, Energize them. You can you know kind of give them some some new tasks and, and empower them to expand their skill sets as well, which I think is really helpful if you want to have long term staff. Uh, also, it allows you to do things. Uh, that you couldn't do for you. you have that that patient, you know, that's getting to be for us uh, the college kids heading back to school. Every every year it seems like you have at least one or two of these college kids that had an endo in July shows up <coughs> in your office in August and says, "Oh, now I need that crown on that endo tooth." In the past, that was a real pain in the neck. You'd have to temporize them and then hopefully get them back when they're on break at some point and get their final crown in and hope they don't lose the temporary while they're at school. You're able to get that restoration done right away for that patient. Patient walks in. You know, broken tooth, and you've got an opening in your schedule. You just, you know, okay, boom, we're gonna go ahead and do a crown and, and get that done for you all in one visit. Uh, they, they, they really do enjoy having that. So, it, it does, uh, it does change the way you practice. It adds a lot of capability to your practice. Uh, so, I, I, I think it's something that you know. I know the big scare for most dentists is, is the cost, but believe me, that that is, you know, you. Well, start... I want to, I want to, I want to say one thing. You know, yep. the the cost on a balance sheet. Yeah, you bought a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but on a statement of cash flow, if you're already paying out five thousand for that's, a lab, and now you're just paying less money right. to a little bit. But, but I want to uh, address another uh, complaint. Yeah. Um, I don't trust those all ceramics. I I do uh, gold uh, uh, or porcelain uh, fused to precious, or porcelain fused right. to semi precious. And yeah. these yahoos doing all porcelain like Mike and Howard, they're crazy. Yep. Well, I mean, that was that was initially my hold back on CAD CAM too was the materials. But I tell you right now. We, I've had in, we've had the rest of the, uh, the CAD CAM in for five years right now. I've had two Emacs fracture in that time. 
And both of them were, were teeth early on that I designed a little bit too thin and I had done endo through. Those are the only two fractures I've had. The monolithic restorations, the Emax, you're, you're looking at about, you know, uh, strength in the 400 uh, megapascal strength range right now. That's really, really strong. When you're looking at a PFM crown, that the weak length on a PFM crown, which people will have no problem using, that's 160 megapascal strength on the veneering porcelain of a PFM crown. And people don't seem to have any concerns about using PFM crowns in the posterior. You're, you're using a much stronger restoration with, with a monolithic Emax. Uh, it's, it's just it's, it's a better mousetrap. I place them routinely, second molar, you know, n not a problem at all. And uh, it's not just me. You can... You know, a lot of CAD CAM uses it, on dental towels. It, it is, it is, it, they, they have to be reprogrammed because back in the day when I, when I got to school in the 80s, yep. you put a all porcelain crown on a second molar. I remember when Dicors came out and oh, these yeah. all well, porcelain crowns, I mean, right. it was, it was bad news. Right. So right. It's, it's hard to unlearn those early initial traumas that now it just doesn't even seem, it doesn't even seem realistic that there's yeah. all tooth colored materials that you really can't break. I, I've seen dentists on YouTube hammering them into a two yep. by four. Oh yeah, no, they're, they're, you'll see them running them over with cars and all kinds of crazy stuff. But the proof is in, you know, like I said, five years right now of using the material and I'm seeing far less fracture with, with, with uh, monolithic Emax than I ever saw with PFM. Uh, you know, to the point where, I mean, you, the one type of restoration I used to see a lot of fracture with, with PFM was implant restorations. Implant restorations that have no, no give to them, so they're more, more likely to fracture. You put Emax on top of an implant, and you have a much lower fracture rate than you do with PFM. So it, it's, and, I, uh, and I just want to end with one bizarre thing. All mine in my mouth are gold. Yeah. And um, I, um, I'm, nobody wants gold. They, they, they hang it on their ears, their wedding yep. rings, their nose, their belly button, yep. they ankle bracelets. But, man, people just won't put gold in their mouth. No, no, absolutely not. But you know that's that's culture. We, it's culture, and thankfully we have materials now that we we can give them two color restoration. And if you've got a patient who you've got space issues with, zirconia is a great option as well. So if you've maybe got that second molar where you can't get a millimeter and a half a reduction, you can go about a half a millimeter with zirconia. And uh, I wouldn't mess around with zirconia in the office, but you can certainly send that off to the laboratory, and they can produce that for you. And that's a very inexpensive restoration as well. Well, Mike, we are out of time. Okay. And uh, thank you. So are you sitting outside? I'm outside. I'm on my deck right now. Wow. I, I'm <laughs> looking at my background. And uh, Brady, I'm looking at my background. And I'm looking at his background. It's like, I'm, I'm going to do my next podcast outside. That That's amazing. Yeah. But uh, uh, hey, thank you for all the countless volunteer hours you've done on Dental Town over the years, oh. moderating the forums, sharing, posting. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for all you've done for dentistry and for dental town it was an, an awesome amazing hour thank you mike it was great and thanks for having me i appreciate it and thanks for all you do i mean it's your, your site that set this stuff off and I've, I've probably taken a lot more than i've given back over the years from dental town so i appreciate it ah thanks buddy okay right. if you're ever in phoenix stop by and if i'm ever definitely. in massachusetts i'll call you definitely all right good to see you okay good bye to bye. see you all right